Okay, we've started the recording. So welcome to the WCET SAN webcast um, that we're doing in collaboration with APSEA. And I will move to the next slide. This is the federal rulemaking process. So we wanted to offer you this opportunity. It's the federal rulemaking process, how to follow and inform colleagues about the upcoming negotiated rulemaking meetings and outcomes. And we did, and, uh, so I should probably tell you all who I am. I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the Senior Director for Policy Innovations with WCET SAN. And uh, very pleased to be with you. Glad that you all could uh, register and participate today. Um, I know that some of you are not SAN members. You're members of, w of APSEA. And uh, we welcome you, and we'll tell you a little bit more about ourselves in just a second. But uh, welcome to um, participants today from SAN and from APSEA. Uh, so how our day will work is that we will, um, we have, this is being recorded. Uh, we will be posting the slide deck, the recording, and a transcript on the SAN website. Uh, following the uh, webinar. I will also be giving these materials to APSEA for them to be able to post as they normally do um, with their virtual events. So we will be sharing it with them if you're a member of APSEA, but it will be posted on the SAN website um, as well. It'll be a public facing um, page. So APSEA members, if you came to the SAN website, you would find it there as well. So, you know, we welcome you. Uh, we developed this webinar for the purposes of helping to inform people about the upcoming negotiated rulemaking committee that is uh, to start. Actually, the committee meetings will start on Monday. And so um, I am going to put something in the chat. Um, that Ricky will talk about. And I'll explain who Ricky is in just a second because he's my esteemed colleague. Um, so we are joined together with APSEA and uh, one of our colleagues is Ricky LaFosse. And Ricky is the compliance and policy lead at the University of, Mich of Michigan in Ann Arbor, but he is also the chair of the APSEA policy committee. And so he serves both those roles, but he's a, he's a very important colleague of ours with SAN. And I'll, um, I will turn this over to him in just a second. But just some of the housekeeping items of today. What you'll see here is uh, this is meant to be rather informal. We have uh, our, our guest uh, speaker today, Russ Poulin, who is the executive director for WCET. And he will be sharing with us about the steps in the, the United, uh, in the uh, Department of Education rulemaking process. Both he and our other special guest, David Skibal, who's the president of Excelsior College, um, have experience working in negotiated rulemaking. Both of them served on the subcommittee in the 2019 uh, federal rulemaking um, process. They were on the subcommittee of the ne negotiated rulemaking and informing the main committee. And then Russ Poulin also served on the 2014 rulemaking uh, committee. So uh, they bring a lot of experience to us, but Russ will walk us through these steps and then we're going to move to a moderated panel discussion where we will be talking with both David and Russ um, about their experience and some of the nuances that um, will be further developed from the steps that Russ has shared. And we hope that at that time, as you're hearing um, these pieces and these nuance about rulemaking, that you will add your questions to the chat. So at that point, we hope that you will. You'll start putting uh, your questions in the chat and we'll have um, definitely time for questions, you know, throughout. So it's a piece of information sharing about the process and then moving into moderated, which just really means that we hope that it's inviting your further questions. So we will be taking questions from the audience. We uh, hope that you will include them into the chat and uh, we will address those. But without further ado, I would like to get started with our content. And to do that, we have our moderator today, who I said was uh, Ricky LaFosse. He is, again, the Compliance and Policy Lead at the University of Michigan, and he's the chair of APSEA's Policy Committee. And so welcome, Ricky, and, and you know, really glad to have you here with us today, and thank you for being willing to moderate this session. Absolutely, and thanks, Cheryl, uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, I want to quickly go over a bit of additional housekeeping and provide some background on the topic uh, before turning this over to Russ. Um, so first and foremost, we do realize that there may be a range of prior experience with regulatory matters among the audience. Um, and we would therefore like to encourage you to request clarification using the chat as needed. We'll be monitoring and addressing questions throughout, but we'll also save 
Uh, any more substantive questions for our presenters uh, to that dedicated block Cheryl mentioned towards the end. Um, <clears throat> in addition, we are sharing several resources later in the slides uh, for those of you who'd like to learn more about rulemaking or higher ed governance more broadly, um, including resources developed from both uh, UPSIA and SAN. Um, and in terms of important background, uh, first agency rulemaking um, procedures do differ by uh, agency. And the Department of Education's use of negotiated rulemaking or NEGREG for short uh, is itself somewhat unique. Depending on the topic, Congress does explicitly require um, as part of the Higher Education Act, NEGREG sessions to take place early on in the drafting process. Um, and this is in an effort to ensure a diverse range of perspectives will be considered from the start. Um, other more broadly used and required administrative procedures, such as those uh, involving notice and comment, for example, uh, these are likewise subject to acts of Congress. Um, and it is an <clears throat> important to keep in mind that agencies um, really can't deviate too far from the goals and the specific language that Congress is using as part of any authorizing legislation that agencies are working from. If uh, Congress says that institute, an institution has to do X to remain eligible for federal funding, and an agency thinks, well, you know, in our experience, it'd be better if they did Y instead, or perhaps X and Y together, uh, the re resulting rule is likely going to be struck down in courts, um, just as if it would, just as it would if the agency failed um, to follow procedural uh, requirements prescribed by Congress. Um, presidential administrations also have a sizable role in the work of federal agencies as they oversee the executive branch um, and can influence agency rulemaking agendas and priorities to be consistent with those of the administration. Um, and perhaps you are curious about whether you actually have to follow the rules to begin with. Um, you know, technically the answer would be no, if, as long as you're willing to forfeit eligibility um, for the, the billions of dollars that flow through federal funding programs. Uh, and as that proposition is probably untenable for the vast majority of institutions, um, perhaps the better way would be to play ball in the process and engage in the rulemaking process itself, um, participating in the ways that we'll talk about here today. And this is in essence why we are here um, sharing this information with you today. Uh, we'll, we'll strive to get you, um, give, give you uh, good ways to stay informed throughout the process of rulemaking, as well as actively participate. And if you are members of UPSIA or SAN, or ideally both, um, participate in the listservs, you are in good hands as both organizations are going to work to keep their members always informed and up to date, um, including with the upcoming NEGREG session starting next week. Uh, which primarily are addressing affordability and student loan issues. Um, but there is some, uh, including the bar defense rule, um, topics where institutions may want to pay some attention because they involve uh, misrepresentation rules um, and updates that might impact how you approach marketing as well as consumer disclosures at your institution. Um, so with that, actually, I think in the interest of time, I will go over to Russ here. Um, and thank you in advance, Russ, for walking us through this, this complicated process. I'll hand it off to you. Well, thank you all. And thank you very much, Ricky, for that uh, introduction. Again, uh, Russ Poulin uh, with uh, WCET. And I did serve on the main committee in 2014. And uh, they did six roles in that time and then uh, served on uh, the subcommittee with David in, in 2019, and we had, uh, depending on how you count, like 55 rules or something like that that were on there. And but on our subcommittee, we had a much smaller, uh, but still sizable group of things that we looked at. Well, let's move to the next slide, uh, Cheryl, and go to this. And so I uh, tried to bring this down. We're going to go through uh, sort of a complicated process rather quickly here, just to give you uh, give you the background uh, and. Uh, in these uh, steps that they have here that they go through. So let's go to the next slide uh, they have here. And that where this starts off, and then as uh, Ricky sort of alluded to, that there, the department will identify particular regulations or topics that they want to, to work on. And, and sometimes it's a clarification uh, of things that are already there. Sometimes there's a new law that comes out and that they need to figure out, okay, the law is a little bit vague. How do we 
interpret that or how do we enforce that? Uh, uh, what are institutions supposed to do in order to show that, that they're meeting that law? And so that there needs to be some more uh, administrative details around that. And that's where the uh, rule making comes in. And so they'll identify a set of topics. They'll uh, uh, post this notice uh, out there that they're uh, about exactly which ones they're going to work on, uh, that there's a, uh, and if there's a committee or subcommittee structure, the subcommittee is a new thing as of the uh, 2019 rulemaking. And that seemed to work pretty well. They had three subcommittees then. I think they have one in the, in the current one I have now. And so uh, uh, they'll announce that structure. And then what they'll do is that they'll want to seek uh, nominees from uh, what are uh, referred to as affected constituencies that, uh, that, you know, who knows about this issue. So if it's about financial aid, we need some financial aid officers. If it's about, um, I represented uh, uh, distance ed, or they might need people from the four-year institutions or two-year institutions or, or from different consumer, uh, consumer groups. And so they'll ask for people to uh, uh, either nominate themselves or get nominated for it. And then let's go to the next one. And so you submit those nominations uh, and then the uh, department gets to I put some wording there that shows that, you know, they are looking for kind of a diverse group of people that, who, that represent very, very specific areas. Uh, that they select, look through, they go through the nominations, uh, uh, the department makes their selections. Uh, for the main committees, they select both a primary and a secondary negotiator. And so you have an alternate uh, uh, for, for each of those. And that provides a little depth in case something happens to them, but it also provides uh, some more input because uh, uh, so in 2014, I was the distance ed person and served with Marshall Hill. Uh, president of uh, uh, NC SARA uh, that we work work together and we're able to bring uh, uh, some different different parts uh, different ideas to it and so that worked out well and then also uh, among the negotiators it's important to note that the uh, department is one of the negotiators and so they get a vote in all of this too and we'll show where that comes up uh, a little bit later on uh, let's move to the next slide. Okay, we've got the negotiation, we've got the role, we've got the topics, we've got the roles. And so there's a lot of preparation that goes on before the first meeting. Uh, the document uh, or the uh, uh, department creates uh, background materials and it, it just may be materials. Or last time, the other thing that they did was that they, they came out with uh, full proposals uh, at the first meeting. That was a little bit, uh, that was a little bit different than what they've done before. And contrary to what you may have heard in the press or something like that, they actually, were willing to move off of those proposals. Some people thought that they had put the proposals and that, that would be, a, that's not what happened. Uh, and also then the negotiators at the same time are getting uh, getting ready. And then uh, I know I, I talked to a lot of different people about their ideas and tried to collect uh, uh, thoughts about, you know, what what would work in, in some of the rules we're looking at. Let's go to the next slide is that the uh, very important meeting is the first meeting. And this is actually a picture from the uh, end of the main committee of the 2019 one, uh, not the first meeting, but uh, but as a screenshot that we took because they streamed that whole uh, process last time. It gives you an idea that we're uh, uh, pre-COVID, as you can tell, uh, <laughs> that we're all sitting close together and and, uh, and discussing things. I'll be curious to see what they do with COVID this time. Uh, but they, they have some protocol things that they have to go through, that have, how they conduct the meetings. Uh, those usually don't change very much. They confirm the issues uh, that they, uh, and, uh, education submits their, what they've proposed and that uh, uh, there's some discussions and about, and it comes out of that meeting in terms of what additional information or what changes to any proposals that they want to see or, or things that they, that, uh, want to see proposed in terms of language, you know, language to consider at the next meeting that comes up. And all of these meetings end with public comment. And so it's available for anyone who wants to that they, on any of the issues they want to. And sometimes they talk about things that aren't the issues that are there, which is always interesting, but there's some time for public comment for people who aren't on the committees to give their input as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. and. This gets to what is the uh, uh, purpose of all this? And it's this word consensus is one of the things that we're trying to get to. And consensus has a lot of definitions in a lot of different areas, but it's very specific here. 
and really have it there. And I have an Inside Higher Ed article where they talked about uh, the Department of Ed uh, actually uh, popping champagne because they came to consensus on those 55 ish issues last time. But the consensus in this, think about this, that you saw all those people around the table. So you probably have, you know, depending on the one you have, uh, uh, depending on the uh, NIG reg process, you have 10 to 20 people and they all have to agree on all of the language on every issue. Uh, they have it. They, they tried uh, subdividing it last time, which was very un unusual and with the legality of that was, may have been in question, but they did come up with uh, uh, agreement on all the different different issues. And so that is uh, uh, very hard to do in these sorts of things. And remember the Department of Ed is one of the ones who vote uh, in all of this. And if they don't reach consensus, if they don't all agree, then the department gets to write the rules. Well, okay, uh, but what happened, and I was in one where we didn't reach consensus and, and actually the parts that we agreed to that the department was very good at um, keeping that language, uh, uh, that if we agreed to it, that they put that forward. If, um, if there was areas where there was, we couldn't come to agreement to, they tried to play, they tried to figure out, okay, how is this gonna work between the two parties and where the disagreements were? So. Um, this trying trying to get everybody to uh, agree on things is a lot of work and, uh, and trying and uh, uh, something that is the goal that is you know, not reached all that often in terms of getting these together. Uh, with that, let's move to the next one. So there's lots of negotiation going going on. So this is a, a picture of the subcommittee from last time. So you kind of get get an idea there. And I in both of my Subcommittee in my committee, I got to set through next to Leah Matthews, who you see there partially on the left. Uh, and we were uh, uh, buddies uh, talking about all these rules, going through the whole thing. And that was very, very helpful. But uh, um, in the subcommittee that, that they meet outside of the main committee and that they will make proposals to the main committee, um, that there's a lot of uh, proposals that are put forward about specific language. Uh, so a group, maybe the consumer protection folks will come through or these attorneys general will come through and they'll propose specific language and that will be considered uh, uh, in all this. Uh, um, that there's, uh, again, consulting with the constituencies about you know what, what happens. Uh, we were very big uh, when I served on them about we would write blog posts and put the proceedings out there and that here's what we were seeing. And if we had questions, we'd ask people, you know, let me know. Uh, if you have suggestions about what we should be doing. You see the name tags there on end and there's a very, uh, it's proceed, that's saying that you want to uh, ask a question or make a comment. And so that uh, uh, that keeps things in order and it's very, uh, uh, very, very civil sort of discussion uh, most of the time uh, works out pretty well. So we, you know, all this goes on and then uh, we have this back and forth both at the meetings and between the meetings. Uh, uh, very formal uh, recommendations about what language should go forward between the meetings. Now let's get to the next slide where we finally get to the last meeting. And, and it could be three or four. One time we decided to have an extra meeting because we couldn't get through uh, everything that uh, we there's a vote at the end where first there's the finalizing language. We come up with, okay, here's the language. And there's Usually there's straw votes ahead of that. We kind of know where people are and where the pain points are. And then you have a vote and uh, on each different regulation, each different topic that they have, that there's a vote about that. Do we, have we reached consensus on it? And, and again, everybody has to agree. And we usually, don't, and we don't take the final vote until we think either that we're at consensus or uh, that consensus is, is not possible. And so they wait for the final vote for the end. So with that, uh, let's move to the uh, next part. So let's see, there's uh, a couple paths uh, uh, here in that you're seeing a, uh, uh, a, a graphic that we had from a Frontiers post that we had after the uh, uh, last negotiated rulemaking. Uh, if there's uh, no consensus. Remember that the Department of Education gets to write the language, and uh, they do try to adhere to what came out of the committee. Um, if there is consensus, they'll, they'll have to do some things in terms of making sure, you know, because sometimes things get changed at the last minute. 
uh, or there's new suggestions in the final one and they have to check to make sure that it's all legal and that what we're proposing is not in conflict with that, some other part of the law, that would be bad. And so sometimes there's some changes there. Once the, once the department and their lawyers get that all together, they publish it uh, in the federal register uh, for everyone to see that they're saying, hey, this is the final proposed language and they ask for comments. And it's usually, it's been as little as 30, but usually 60 days is a good time for comments. And this is something where uh, uh, both APSIA and SAN and WCT have uh, asked people to comment uh, on all this because it's important. You need to participate in, in there's places where you could participate above, but really in this comment period, if there's something you don't like, you know, really write something because volume matters. You can really, uh, if you're seeing the same thing from several different people, they have some ability to do some changes. There's lots of restrictions on what they can change, but there is some ability to change. With that, uh, final two things here we're getting down to, uh, that uh, once they uh, get those comments, that they uh, uh, look at all of them, that they write a, a preamble that gives their reasoning for all of the rules, why they're needed, uh, why they did certain things within the rules, uh, and maybe some clarifications about that they could see from the comments that people weren't quite getting things. And then they respond to all the comments. They're supposed to respond to all the comments. Um, they'll often, they'll get, you know, 50 comments about one thing, so they'll clump them together and and, and, and uh, respond to them as a group. But, you know, if you put something in there, they are supposed to respond to them and uh, do them. And, and they'll also note uh, if there's any changes that they've made uh, as a result of the comment uh, process and that they'll, uh, they'll publish that. And then moving to the next one, the last uh, part I have here is that the date that they publish it makes a big difference. Rules always go into effect. Department of Ed rules always go into effect on July 1st. And it all depends about whether they publish them before or after November 1st, uh, because those, if they're published uh, prior to November 1st, they go into effect the following year. So if they were to be, let's say they had rules now, if they were to be published today, they would go into effect July, uh, July 1st of 2022. Uh, if it went, if it waited till December, as happened last time, they had rules that came out. Uh, um, in December and that those would have to wait a whole other year, a whole other calendar year. It wouldn't be 2022, but it'd be off into 2023 when those would be those would be published. With that, that's a whole lot of stuff. Went a little longer than I thought, but it's uh, uh, quite a few things, but gives you a, a, a background on uh, the process of all of this. And so Ricky, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Russ. Um, so it looks like uh, we do have uh, David joining us as well. He is here. Um, so to reintroduce David, uh, David Stable is the president of Excelsior College in Albany, New York. Um, and at the time, Cheryl mentioned that he served with uh, Russ as part of that last uh, round of negotiated rulemaking on the, the subcommittee for uh, distance learning and educational innovation. Um, and at that time, he was vice president and chief uh, digital learning uh, and chief of digital learning at Marquette University. Um, so, David, I'm going to go to you first, if that's all right. And uh, given your you know, vast leadership experience in higher ed um, and the, the roles that you were serving on the committee, uh, I was wondering if you could share uh, your thoughts on the importance of participation in this part uh, in this process from an institutional governance perspective. So I hope, uh, do we have David here or is he stuck on mute? Sorry, I started talking and I was stuck on mute. Um, no worries, thank you. So, so thanks, Ricky, and, and good to be with all of you. Um, so as, as Russ explained, the process uh, is pretty weedy. And um, so you gotta, you gotta like the policy stuff to follow it. Um, what, what, was clear to me though, not just from participating this last time, but um, from other, uh, other negotiated rulemaking processes is that the consequences of the process can be really significant for institutions. And so if institutions aren't paying attention 
and um, and whispering in the ear of uh, the negotiators or others who could influence the negotiators, uh, they might end up with uh, regulations that they don't want. Um, so I'll give you an example of one of the regulations, Russ, you'll remember this, that we struggled with that actually uh, was proposed by uh, folks at the Department of Education. And, and that was, um, uh, what percent of a curriculum can an institution outsource and still be eligible for federal financial aid? So the proposal uh, made uh, under the DeVos administration was to actually increase the amount of uh, curriculum that an institution could outsource to 100% for a program. Right now it's 50%, it was 50%. And this was a big part of debate because as you might imagine, for some institutions, it would actually be much cheaper to outsource all of their curriculum, especially if they don't have any faculty expertise in a particular area. So imagine that you wanna stand up uh, a cybersecurity program, but you don't even have a computer science department. Um, it would be a heck of a lot easier to outsource that part of the curriculum than to, uh, to build an entire cybersecurity program, for example. So, um, so that was one of the issues that was being discussed, and it, it was a robust discussion, as you can imagine. And, um, and, and there were good arguments made for both sides. Uh, uh, on the one hand, it seems that it can undermine the credibility of an institution and what it means to get a degree from a particular school, given that you might not actually uh, have the benefit of any faculty at that institution if that school was to outsource all of uh, its programmatic curriculum. Uh, at, at the same time, um, it would allow schools to have much broader uh, curricular arrays than they can afford, especially small liberal arts schools, um, schools that have uh, very focused uh, areas of expertise and simply can't build the curriculum. So, so that's just one example. And, and between Russ and me, I'm sure we can give you another 25 if you really want to know. But, um, but that would be one example where the 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 consequence of the negotiated rulemaking process can have real impacts on institutions uh, once that process is done. So I don't wanna keep talking. I just wanted to give you an example of how um, the process really does matter from an institutional perspective and happy to answer questions or kind of go in whatever direction you all wanna go. Thanks so much, David. And you know what I appreciate about it, what I appreciate about that response too. I mean, on the one hand, it's the if you know if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, we we often hear about these uh, types of uh, rulemaking activities, but it's also uh, in a very real way you produce better rules um, by being more engaged. The rules themselves can come out to be of a higher quality. Um, so. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Russ, feel free to respond as well from, um, if you have any thoughts to add based on what um, David uh, just, just responded with, but um, I'm also curious uh, to know, were there times as a negotiator, and you've now been in the room twice here, um, where you experienced some very thorny issues um, where it was clear that the path to consensus um, might, might actually be defeated? Um, how were you able to overcome those conflicts? You know, were there times where you weren't? And if you were able to overcome them, how, how did you actually proceed and, and do that? Well, that's a great, great question, Ricky. And, and uh, just to follow on with David, that the importance of participation that we, uh, you know, there's a reason that we follow these things and put them out on blog posts and such is that, that there are some really significant uh, 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 impact uh, to some of these rules. And so you want to make sure that you uh, get your voice heard. And, and uh, if not before, especially at that comment period, because they do, it does make a difference how many comments that they get and, and what, what goes on and, and, and all along the way. With that, and great question about uh, uh, conflict. Yes, we have, <laughs> we're all representing different constituencies and trying to, uh, you know, forward, and we have all these people whispering in our ears about, you know, 
you must get this. And, and, uh, and uh, there's a few times where I had my integrity called into question on one issue, but then we were working very closely on another issue. So that was always interesting and usually ended up, and the nice thing about being in a small room pre-COVID is that you ended up uh, pretty much talking to everybody at some time or other or in, and, uh, and collaborating at least with half of them at some time or other. And, uh, and I remember that um, uh, in 20, 2014, that, you know, when, where we fit, where there was uh, uh, what several of us thought were agreed upon language coming into the last day uh, on, on state authorization and things. And then it got changed on the last day by the department and some others where the thing that we had, I, every time I spoke in that negotiated rulemaking, the thing I started with on the state authorization, I started with, we must get rid of, I think it was section eight, I think it was. <laughs> and they got it, rid of it and then they put it back in and we said, well, we can't, it, it was a deal breaker and we didn't have time to negotiate something else. And uh, we ended up not coming to consensus on that issue and thus breaking all consensus. On the, on the happy side, in, uh, there were several times where we did come to agreement on, on things in that negotiated rulemaking. But in 2019 that I know, a really tough issue was on regular and substantive interaction. I know David gave a lot of great uh, input on that. And an example is the word regular and trying to define that. And I was representing, one of the things I was representing was competency-based education. Well, how do you define regular by something that by its definition is somewhat irregular in terms of the interactions that happen? And so, and I thought that, and man, there were loads of proposals. That was great that we considered a lot of things. And I really thought that the language that came out of the subcommittee was pretty, it was, it was probably as far as we were able to, to go. We, I, I think David had some suggestions that would have taken us farther and I appreciated those. Uh, those didn't quite get, but we, uh, um, there was genuine back and forth with, uh, with others about, oh, I like this set of yours, I like this set of yours. How do we put this together uh, to make it work? And so I think that was one where it's not everything, it's not, everything that everybody lost something, but you had to negotiate and everybody, what the process, what came out of it was probably as good as we could get. Now there were some problems when it went to the main committee, but I will, I'll leave that, <laughs> I'll leave that aside that it got changed just a little bit. Uh, but I thought that we worked very, very well together on that. Yeah, and bringing up how you may have wanted to go further in some directions, you think, um... Was, was it more that you were concerned with how the main committee might treat it? Or uh, I guess in this case with regular and substantive interaction, it's you know part of statute, um, mentioned limitations there as well. Um, was it the statutory language that kind of posed a problem there? Was it just um, it, it was, concerns over main committee? Well, it was, uh, uh, some of it was statutory because uh, so regular is in the statute. We couldn't change that. And so we had to try to come up with a definition of regular that still, you know, regular came into the statutes back in 1992 and didn't, uh, didn't uh, anticipate, anticipate a lot of the uh, innovations that have happened, happened since then. So there is that. And the other was uh, kind of vote counting. We knew that there were certain things that would make perfect uh, sense to us that would would not fly either uh, with some of the, some of the constituency groups that were uh, represented there or in the main committee, or uh, uh, others where uh, I was thinking about one, and I, I think David may have been the one to put this in there, and it had to do with the uh, uh, student identity verification, uh, and that that's only for distance education courses, and so. Uh, somebody said, well, why not for all courses? Why, you know, why aren't we worried about this for face-to-face? -face? And I think uh, uh, just the like the regular four-year institutions probably would have hated us if we would <laughs> we get that through. But it was worth putting forward on the table to make the point that why isn't this for everyone? Uh, I think on behalf of the distance education community, we certainly appreciate you trying to eliminate double standards wherever you can. Um, so I think uh, actually one more quick follow-up. Um, we talked about consensus a bit. What does happen if we're, you know, if consensus cannot be reached? Um, I guess 
procedurally, what are the next steps at this point? Is it just the U.S. Department of Education just takes it upon itself, does whatever it wants, or is it a little more nuanced than that? Do you want to talk to that, David, or do you want me to? <laughs> well, so I, I, I'm going to be very flippant, but they can pretty much do whatever they want. If they, uh, if they don't, if, if the, uh, the negotiators don't reach consensus, the department can do whatever it wants. Yeah, and that was a lot of the impetus for getting to consensus last time was that there was, uh, with the professional staff and the department uh, appointed staff who were uh, in the room, that there was a lot of negotiation and there was worry that once it got away from this small group of people who had banded together, that it, it could go in all sorts of different ways. All right, thank you. I'm gonna ask uh, one more before we turn it over to the audience here. Um, and uh, I mentioned the chat too, but please feel free to add any questions you have there. Um, I think once we get to the audience section, uh, you can also feel free to take yourself off mic and ask directly, um, off mute rather and ask directly um, that way if you'd prefer. Um, but first, uh, so David, I know, or I believe your official constituent constituency group designation as part of those 2019 sessions um, was academic executive officers at post-secondary institutions. Um, so I'm curious, how did you approach your role as a re representative for that constituency? Um, did you reach out to others in the group? Did anyone try to contact you during the process? Um, and also, did you, you know, experience any challenges just balancing the entrance interests of that group or those you were most concerned with, with, um, you know, maybe other constituency groups present? Well, so um, it's a good question. I, uh, so I had been at Marquette, uh, I think about a year, maybe even less when, um, when I uh, was on the uh, negotiated rulemaking process. Prior to that, I was in the University of Wisconsin system for 11 years. And, um, and when I was at the University of Wisconsin, we uh, built a competency-based program uh, that was based on direct assessment at the time, and it included all the campuses in the UW system. So I had um, uh, the, the various constituencies in the UW system talking to me. Um, uh, Marquette was probably less of a player because it had a, a much smaller online presence but also um, UPSIA, right? So I have been a member of UPSIA for a long time. I'm a past president, have uh, been on various UPSIA boards uh, functions. And so, um, and, and, and UPSIA nominated me to, to the process. So I ended up sort of feeling like I'm representing a lot of different folks. The common denominator for me was um, uh, that I felt, that I was representing a primarily adult and non-traditional students um, because those are the students that I've worked with uh, throughout my career. And those are the kind of programs that I had been developing. And when we were looking at competency-based education, it was geared towards the adult and non-traditional learner. So, so um, uh, my colleagues and, and, I, and I got uh, emails and texts and uh, voicemail messages from various colleagues who were following the process and who uh, were uh, very engaged and wondering what, you know, what's going on or, hey, don't forget to say this or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but that was certainly how I engaged with folks. And, and if I had questions or I wanted uh, opinions uh, from uh, folks on the outside, I, I contacted them and said, you know, what, what do you think? All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think if there are any questions from the audience, if not, that's fine. I got a long list and we can keep going here. Um, but I did want to give an opportunity for, for anyone who did have those questions. Uh, either we, add them to the chat or oh, we do have ahead, one. Right. We do have one from Catherine. It looks like about how does the department choose negotiators and what is the time commitment and uh, how about if I start with the choosing and you want to talk about time commitment, David? Let's see. That'd be right. And, and so the, the the choosing, we're uh, neither David or I were invited to be behind the scenes to see what happened. And so, <laughs> uh, but. 
been looking at it from what they say and what it appears to happen is that they, uh, they are trying to look for balance in many different ways. And with a small committee, that's really hard because they are uh, you know, starting with race, ethnicity, that they're looking at that type of institution or organization, uh, that they're looking at those sorts of things and they'll have very specific uh, groups that they want to look at. Uh, uh, so type of expertise, you know, sometimes I remember I, the first time I was sitting on in on that they had got way deep in some business and financial aid things that I learned a lot about and have now forgotten almost all of it. Uh, that that was <laughs> interesting sitting at that table, but they had other people who knew that and knew nothing about state authorization. So I was able to bring in that or distance ed. And so I was able to bring that in. Uh, geography, if you ever want to apply that so many of them who apply because you have to pay yourself, you know, your institute organization has to pay to have you go there. So they get a lot of people from the DC area or not far away. So I think uh, if you're from, you know, far West places like Marquette or, <laughs> or Colorado where I'm at, or uh, there were several from California that, that, um, that you have better, a better chance if you're willing to get there because they are looking for geographic diversity. And finally, the last one is politics. Uh, I did not see that in 2014, but I do think there was one person where uh, uh, I kind of learned that it, it seemed like through connections through a governor or senator who was well, highly placed in the party that I think that uh, that may have had a difference. Not often, but happens. Yeah, and in terms of time commitment I'm trying to remember it was over a three week period this is for the subcommittee so the subcommittee actually had a much lower time commitment than the um, the main committee um, it, Russ help me here I, I think we met it was it um, did, we stayed over two nights right each right. time and uh, and it was like start at noon and and then end at noon two days later that kind of thing am I remembering that right? Yeah, so, and we may have had a full day on one of those extra days once too, I think, maybe the middle one, yeah. Yeah, but basically it's it's um, several days uh, per week over a three week period for the subcommittee. And then um, for the, the, um, the full committee, there were several weeks in addition to that and they were there all week. Um, so they were there probably for a month in DC, um, flying home on the weekends. Yeah. And, and, uh, I'd forgotten from the 2014 one to 2019 one, how it, it is quite the time commitment because, uh, uh, if you do it well, you should be talking to your constituents and, and taking phone calls and exchanging emails. And so that that's that take and, and trying to come up with proposals to move the ball forward and that, that does take time. Yeah, and you can't, like <laughs> when you're sitting there, you can't check your email and you know respond to emails and that kind of thing because you really need to be engaged in the process. So if you do end up uh, ever participating, um, check the day job uh, at the door because it's not gonna be happening while you're participating in this. Surely there's allowances for fantasy football, things of that nature. Probably not for this time. Probably of year, not. Anyways. And you got to buy your own lunch because the feds aren't allowed to buy your lunch. All right. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll be silent for about 10, 15 seconds here. If anybody does want to jump on with a question, uh, great opportunity to do so right now. While people are thinking of questions, you know, uh, one thing, and, and Russ started talking about this, that's, that's interesting about the process is that um, when we were talking, as, as Russ said, one big part of the conversation was the regular and substantive, um, the meaning of what regular and substantive interaction is. And, uh, and the reason that this is such a big issue is because, um, the uh, when when you try to do competency based education and you focus your educational uh, program exclusively on outcomes and not on inputs, um, time on task stops to matter. 
And so uh, what, what ends up mattering is what people actually learn and how they demonstrate their knowledge and not how much time they spent learning it. But the problem is that the, the current regulatory space requires that people actually get paid for, i.e. financial aid for, time on task and not outcomes, right? So it doesn't matter what grade you get as long as you pass a course to get your federal financial aid. What matters is how much time you actually spent in the classroom. And the way you verify how much time you spent is how much interaction you have with the material and mostly with faculty. So this is the regular and substantive piece of the conversation. And it becomes um, very obvious at the tension in competency-based education because um, the, the CBE folks want to focus on outcomes and actually want to reduce time on task and leave that up to students so that students can bring prior knowledge to, the, to, their, to, to their learning and so on. Um, and yet the, the law requires uh, that federal financial aid be allocated based on time on task, i.e. the number of credit hours or sorry, contact hours you spend um, for each credit hour that you earn. And, uh, and so it, it, it is a perfect example, I think, of uh, one huge challenge we have in this country uh, between focusing on learning outcomes, which everybody wants to do, and yet having a regulatory structure that doesn't care about learning outcomes in the sense that it doesn't matter what the outcomes are for you to get federal financial aid. So, um, so it's, it's, it's actually a huge national issue about how federal financial is allocated and on what criteria it's allocated. And it, it ends up getting played out in conversations like the one we had a couple of years ago. Yeah, and there's actually a head scratching quote in the WGU audit that says exactly that. It doesn't matter what the outcomes were. It was that they didn't matter in the process. They had no complaints, outcomes were good. Um, luckily that got turned around. And I think that we've solved, now it's, um, we solved some of those things in the regular and substantive uh, definitions. So I think we helped uh, move that along. Yeah, I think I think a big advancement would have been inclusion of asynchronous activities more explicitly in the regulations. And I know from what was proposed, one of the only changes uh, that I recall it going into the final rules, um, you know, David talked about um, credit hours uh, and how you record, you know, time on task or contact hours there, uh, clock hours for for programs on that system. Um, you know, one of the updates through notice and comment and, and the comments received was that asynchronous activities were also included under that definition, which actually happened after the rule was first proposed. Um, and, you know, along those lines, I, I did want to ask too, um, kind of gave it away, but, you know, why would it be important once we have a, a proposed rule out for institutions to engage in that process and then also um, what key units may be at, you know, institutions. I know there's a lot of variation institutions at the institution, but generally speaking, what key units should be involved in uh, submitting comment? Um, if you're personally interested, do you, do you have to work elsewhere in your institution or can you submit your own? Um, wonder if you could share any insights related to that comment submission process. You want to start with that, David, or you want me to? Well, well, I mean, just very briefly, there's no restrictions on people contacting a negotiator and sharing comments. Um, what the negotiator does with it is a separate question, right? But, but anybody can say, hey, here's what I think. Go do this. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, the, the why for getting involved with this is that, remember, I think that there's... Uh, 6,000 institutions that receive federal financial aid. Within those institutions, there's a variety of academic models. And so one of the, one of the challenges is, is trying to write these broad enough that it fits all those. And, and it's still a small group and that we may get to a point where we thought, oh, you know, we didn't, we didn't address, you know, some small, some 
subgroup out of all that. And that, so it's very important that if you see something where you're left out or it's going to uh, have a huge impact on your academic model that you need to speak up because no one will know about it unless those who are, are uh, affected do speak up. Yeah, and the uh, I, I, to build on on what Russ said, um, one of the the challenges is uh, innovation in higher education, and if if that innovation requires changing the the um, the teaching structure, the teaching model in terms of time on task. So if you if you're teaching uh, two semesters a year where students are coming to the classroom three days a week or you know, two uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays for an hour and a half and they're sitting there listening to a lecture or talking with faculty, no issue, uh, no problem with federal financial aid. On the other hand, if you want to somehow incorporate um, prior learning, if you want to uh, allow students to do a lot of self-directed learning, um, and have uh, engagement with faculty only when they really need it rather than um, on some prescribed schedule, then you run straight smack into the, um, the, the, uh, the challenges with the regulatory space. And so, um, so institutions that wanna do different stuff uh, should pay a lot of attention to this because um, higher education is a highly regulated industry and um, the, the law gets interpreted in very specific ways. And the interpretation happens at the department, but of course the, the lawmaking process happens in Congress. Hey, thank you. And um, yeah, we did have a question coming in related to uh, what, what's published as part of that, that preamble. Are all comments uh, included there or responses to comments? Um, and you know, to to add to that question uh, from from Cheryl um, Andres, um, I, I think it would also be helpful to know. You know, we have the final rules at the bottom as part of what's published in the, the Federal Register. But you know, after this proposed rule, the NPRM uh, comes out, and you're submitting comments, you get the final rule. Uh, what? Why do we have the preamble? What else is there that might be useful? Um, to institutions looking to implement these final rules, um, in addition to, to Cheryl's question. How about if I talk about the comments you want to talk about, what else might be there, David? And so, and then in the comments, what they'll do is that they'll, uh, they'll do a, a comment response and then action, I think is the third one. And I may have got that word wrong. But what they'll do is that quite often they'll receive 30, 50 comments about the same thing and that they'll They'll say, we received several comments saying uh, we disagree with this about regular uh, and that they'll they'll try to summarize it and, and that they try to be very brief. And then they'll uh, and then so that they'll do that, they'll give their response and then they will say say whether there's any changes that they've made because of that. And, and quite often I'll just say no changes, but they won't get back to you personally. They'll put it in there. They do. They are supposed to have somewhere where they can point that they uh, get to uh, every uh, every comment that they come in. Uh, sometimes I remember one of ours was very quick and cursory in terms of how they dealt with it. <laughs> dealt with it, so they they don't have to give a, a full and complete response to it. But it uh, um, they uh, you know are very good about re responding to identifying them and responding to them within the final. Uh, final rules. Yeah, I'm not sure I have anything to add, Russ. Well, I think I think that probably the only uh, other thing would be that they uh, there are times where they talk about either their philosophy or what they're trying to get trying to accomplish with these, or if they're seeing that there's a um, well, sometimes it's within the comments that if they see that there's misunderstandings about part of it that they try to. Uh, try to do that, but it's it's the, as much as possible. They try to do it around the comments. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like far more likely to clarify in the preamble than actually make a rule change at that point, if, if they can avoid it. Of course. Um, 
All right. So I think, uh, yeah, given the time here, I think I'm going to pass it back over to Cheryl to uh, take us home with uh, a few more slides about our resources. And I just want to thank uh, both Russ and, and David for being here and sharing their uh, vast expertise with us on this process. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Unless we lost Cheryl. Cheryl, are you still with us? Ricky, you want to say a little bit about Epsia? And... Sure, yeah. Look, I think she's uh, stuck on mute. Let's try to see if I can do anything on my end here. Um, yeah, so um, kind of go over um well basically what's what's on the remaining slides here we did want to point out uh for both memberships Upsia and uh san um there are ample um resources devoted to this topic uh or you know negotiated rulemaking and the u.s department of education higher education governance um more broadly than that um and I think most valuably in both cases, for me personally, um, there are these very active communities um, where members uh, through a listserv uh, and discussion board, in the case of UPSIA, it's called uh, CORE or CORE E, uh, the E's lowercase there. Um, and the and in the uh, case of SAN, it's on WCT Mix. Um, there are different communities that you could subscribe to um, and there's uh, a lot of people who are um, devoting, you know, through their work and, and attention, a lot of time to various compliance topics, usually in the online learning uh, and distance education space, uh, but also um, specifically for STAN as a state authorization network, state authorization issues, um, and they've really ex expanded in both cases uh, to a more uh, rounded and, um, I guess, uh, comprehensive set of topic areas. Um, and I, I just strongly encourage, um, without the slides here, I, I think Googling um, or just searching online for both UPSIA um, and WCET SAN uh, will bring you to those relevant pages and you can explore those resources and communities. And I strongly encourage you to do so. I'll just add that it's also a great place if, if you're uh, if you're a policy wonk or a policy wonk wannabe and you want to talk to colleagues who have the same interests and um, uh, and share information, both associations are really good for that. Um, and you'll get different la levels of expertise, right? So you'll get people who um, have been around the block a few times like Russ and me. And you'll have um, uh, newbies who are just starting out, and so there's no such thing as a bad question. And I think uh, the the uh, the participants in, in those forums tend to be very open and, and very helpful. So I would encourage anybody who's interested in this topic or or any other topic that's brought up at either uh, association to to engage because those are really good forums to learn. I'm going through the slides here, Cheryl. Uh, and UPSIA, so San and UPSIA will both uh, will share the slides. It has our contact information if you have additional information uh, beyond this and uh, just some background about UPSIA and SAN state authorization part of state authorization network part of uh, uh, part of WCT a separate membership within within WCT and uh, just letting you know that uh, let's see I guess we've got SAN has a some sessions coming up, uh, sensational word session in December, uh, international compliance is best practices in February and a SANS basic workshop, uh, more coming up on that in March. And so with that, uh, maybe, maybe Cheryl's there, let's see, it keeps going in and out, but, but thank you, Ricky, for hosting this. And thank you, David, for being, being part of this. And thank you, David, or thank you, Cheryl, uh, 
<laughs> uh, we, didn't, we didn't really try to silence her, but uh, there we are. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And I put my uh, email contact in the chat if anybody wants to reach out. Happy to chat. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, like Russ alluded to, we will follow up with those resources. Um, if you are uh, an APSEA member, you'll receive those uh, through CORE. Um, and then for those of you on SAN, uh, Cheryl mentioned that they'd be posted on the website. So thanks again so much for joining us and have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.